Today, we're going to take a look at the state of Soviet artillery, mortars and anti-tank guns on the Axis Soviet front on the eve of the Great Patriotic War. This is the new and improved version of this video, since I did this a couple of days ago and messed up with one of the charts. The link to the old video will be in the description for those of you who really want to go and see where I went wrong. Soviet artillery was split into two forces, the first being the regular force artillery, which was the organic regiments and battalions that are within rifle divisions and corps. Then we have artillery from the Reserve of the High Command, shortened to RGK, later RVGK. This reserve force was a centralised pool of units that could be attached, where needed, to Soviet armies and corps during the war. At the outbreak of war in 1941, 92% of all Soviet artillery was in the regular force artillery. This was the 94 Corps artillery regiments which were supporting armies, corps and divisions at the front. Therefore, barely 8% of Soviet artillery was in the RGK, the Centralized Reserve Artillery Force. And when we look at the total amount of Soviet artillery on the 22nd of June 1941, we find that they had 117,600 guns and mortars, but 37,500 guns and mortars were located in the western border military districts, with the rest nowhere near the front. This is going to be bad, as you'll see. In June of 1941, a typical rifle division would have a light artillery regiment of two battalions, with eight 76mm field artillery guns and four 122mm howitzers each, totaling 24 artillery pieces. They also had a howitzer artillery regiment of two light battalions with 12 122mm howitzers each, plus a medium battalion with 12 152mm howitzers, bringing the total to 36 howitzers. And there was an anti-tank battalion with 18 45mm guns, plus an anti-aircraft battalion with 12 37mm anti-aircraft guns. This means a division had 294 guns and mortars at 50mm size or greater. But is this really the case? Well, no, because this is actually the paper strength. The reality was significantly different. Now, this is where I went wrong last time. I used the wrong chart because I'm a moron. Anyway, here is the chart showing the Southwestern Front's artillery weapons on the 22nd of June 1941. I don't have the numbers for all of the Western military districts, so this will have to do. But it's not unreasonable to imagine that if the Southwestern Front are down in guns of certain calibers, that the rest of the army was also going to be short of these guns as well, because they were. Blue is the number of artillery guns that were required, and red is the number of guns that they actually had. If we look at the first part, we see the numbers for the 45mm anti-tank guns. We've got 2,134 required, and they actually had 1,912 on hand with 62 in repair, therefore 1,850 in working order. That's about 87% of their requirements, which isn't too bad. Obviously, being 13% down in your anti-tank guns on the eve of a Panzer Blitzkrieg attack is definitely not good, but it's not as bad as some of the other weapons such as the 76mm guns. Now, there is a problem with the original chart where I pulled these numbers from. So, to be completely transparent, I'm going to have to give an explanation here as to how I've come to these numbers shown. Table 6.3 in Stumbling Colossus lists the required number of certain 76mm guns as 1037. However, it then lists the shortage of guns as 1,301, and that's impossible. If I require five apples, I can't be short seven. That's breaking the laws of physics. But there is a clue in the numbers. If you add up the on-hand weapons together, you get 1,301. So I don't think that the 1,301 figure is the shortage. I think that's the total on hand. And I think that the requirement number of 1037 is actually the shortage number. If we're short 1037 guns, we require 1037 guns. So I think someone's put this in the wrong box. Therefore, if you add 1037 and 1301 together, you get 2338, which is the number I've used to add together with the other 76mm guns, and this totals 3244, shown in this chart. 
Obviously, this is a bit of a guess, but it is an educated one. And it also makes sense because we know that they required more 76mm guns than 122mm guns, which wouldn't be the case if we left the 76mm gun numbers as they are. So this is absolutely, you know, this absolutely could be wrong. And if I am wrong, fine, but at least I've shown my workings out. And if you disagree, all you have to do is ignore the 76mm gun numbers. But if we accept the numbers, the Southwestern Front was down by roughly 37% of their 76mm guns. This is a significant amount. And considering the Soviets were down 25% of their 122mm guns and 35% of their 152mm guns and howitzers, and that these are the guns found in rifle divisions, this means that the rifle divisions were missing roughly 66% of their artillery pieces. What we have to consider as well is that the Germans alone outnumbered the Soviets on the first day of the war, and most of the German divisions are infantry divisions. Plus, there were infantry in the panzer formations as well. Therefore, the Soviets were severely lacking in the tools required to fight back against them. In terms of anti-aircraft guns, the Soviets are missing 75% of their 37mm guns and 31.5% of their 76mm anti-aircraft guns. Sure, they've got 90% of their 85mm anti-aircraft guns, but it's clear that they're lacking a lot of air defences on the eve of the war. We'll uh, come back to discussing the Soviet anti-aircraft arm later in the video, which is very interesting in itself, but for now, let's look at this other chart. This is a chart showing the fulfilment of artillery and mortar ammunition for units in the Western military districts on the 22nd of June 1941. And yes, if you watch the previous edition of this video, you'll see that this is somewhat different to the numbers used in that. The explanation will be in the pinned comment in the comments section below. Anyway, to explain this chart, if the blue bar is at 100%, then the units have enough ammunition for that weapon. Clearly, they didn't have enough ammunition. They're down by nearly 60% of their anti-tank gun ammunition. So on the eve of a war, where the panzer divisions are going to be knocking on their door, they're lacking 60% of their anti-tank gun ammunition. And as we said, lots of German divisions were infantry divisions, and all of the divisions had infantry in them. So to be down by 67% of your 76mm gun ammunition, which is the most used artillery gun, is also clearly bad. Then, to have only about 55% of the ammunition for your 122mm and 152mm guns basically means your rifle divisions aren't going to have enough ammunition to tackle the German infantry they're about to go up against. And yes, they have just 7.5% of their 37mm anti-aircraft gun ammunition. 7.5%. It's terrible. And while the 85mm ammunition isn't shown, Glantz makes it clear that they're lacking in that ammunition as well. So they're relying entirely on their 76mm anti-aircraft guns. And if we pull up this new chart, this is a mix of the ammunition chart we've just seen and the percentages of the weapons needed for the Southwestern Front. Yeah, it's not ideal because we're comparing the ammunition requirement of the whole of the Western military districts to the number of artillery pieces in just the Southwestern Front, but it should give us an indication of the problem. Blue is ammunition fulfillment and red is the weapons fulfillment. So being at 100% is good. And as we can see, they're down by over 30% of their 76mm anti-aircraft guns anyway, even if they have the ammunition for them. And the 37mm anti-aircraft gun may as well not have bothered. They have 7.5% of the ammunition for them and only have 24% of the guns to fire that ammunition. It's a dual problem. This chart alone explains why the Soviet anti-aircraft defences are completely inadequate during Barbarossa, since they're missing more than half of their guns and lacking in ammunition on top of that. Then when you consider that they don't have enough anti-tank gun ammunition, and that the Soviets are forced to use their anti-aircraft guns as anti-tank guns to stop the waves of enemy panzers, you then realise that their anti-aircraft defences are even more crippled. Yep. They're lacking over 60% of their anti-tank gun ammunition required to take out the Panzers. And coupled with the fact that they're down over 60% of their 76mm field artillery guns and ammunition for them, and the fact that they've only got about 57% of the ammunition required for their 122mm and 152mm guns, which they're also lacking in guns as well, 
we can confidently conclude that the Soviet artillery was not in a position to fight infantry or tanks. And in terms of mortars, they're also lacking in ammunition, especially for the 120mm mortars, but all of them are suffering. So, to summarise, Soviet artillery was significantly handicapped prior to Barbarossa. Sure, maybe overall you could argue that they have more guns than the Germans, but the ammunition for them wasn't sufficient. And if you think this material requirement and fulfilment is bad, it gets worse. Artillery doesn't have an infinite range, and needs to move. But in the Red Army, there was a massive shortage of trucks and tractors to tow the guns and carry ammunition. Only 37.8% of Soviet combat formations had their required tractors when the war began. The RGK lacked up to 85% of their required tractor systems for movement. And on the 22nd of June 1941, most of the vehicles that they did actually have required repair. And the problems continued to mount. Half of the RGK artillery had no repair, reconstruction or other logistical support. And all artillery units were supposed to have artillery correction aircraft to help them aim the artillery. But few of the units actually had them. The Soviets themselves noticed that junior and mid-range artillery commanders were poorly trained and unable to lead their artillery effectively in combat. Target acquisition was poor and commanders were unable to coordinate fire with cooperating units. But according to a report prepared by Lieutenant General Parsarov, Southwestern Front's Chief of Artillery, which was written on the 14th of July 1941, the worst problem was that of transport for ammunition resupply. The report states that the majority of units had to leave more than half of their ammunition at their base when the war began, most of which was subsequently blown up or fell to the enemy. So, that chart we showed before, let's half the values and go with that. Wow. Suddenly, things are a lot worse. And, as we said earlier, the Soviets had 117,600 guns and mortars, and only 37,500 of these were at the front. Because of the lack of transport, Soviet artillery could not be deployed en masse and had to be deployed piecemeal. So, just looking at the sheer number of artillery does not tell the full story. There was also the issue of anti-tank units. The Soviets had neglected anti-tank warfare until they saw the fall of France in 1940. They then suddenly realised that anti-tank warfare was essential, which was far too late. As a result, an anti-tank artillery brigade was created in each army. An anti-tank brigade in June of 1941 had 5,309 men with 120 guns, mostly of the 76mm category. But the Soviets didn't have the weapons to create these new units. So, on the eve of war, most of the divisional and corps artillery guns were taken away to form these new anti-tank brigades. This means that divisions didn't have enough anti-tank guns and had to rely on anti-tank rifles, which weren't going to be effective. Now, someone pointed out that the Soviets didn't have anti-tank rifles at the beginning of the war. I don't know if this is true or not, but Glantz makes it clear that they did. This, the creation of anti-tank brigades, left most Soviet forces deficient in anti-tank capability, and once war began, these forces had to make do with the cheaper and more easily produced, but markedly less effective, anti-tank rifles. This is why the Red Army soldiers ended up using most of their anti-aircraft guns as anti-tank guns, rather than as anti-aircraft guns. And since there was already shortages of basically everything, the anti-tank brigades themselves were also lacking in trucks, tractors, and had trouble conducting reconnaissance and acquiring targets. On top of all of this, the NKO, which is short for Ministry of Defence or People's Commissariat for Defence, decided to abolish the post of Chief of Red Army Artillery. The result, to quote Glantz, left the Red Army's artillery decentralised, poorly controlled, relatively immobile, without adequate logistical support, and largely ineffective when war began. The Germans then exploited these flaws. When Operation Barbarossa opened up, Soviet artillery forces had been outmaneuvered and destroyed. Four of the ten anti-tank brigades were completely wiped out in the initial battles, with many of the others reduced in the fighting as well. 
and because the Red Army was forced to deploy their anti-aircraft guns as anti-tank guns to stop the waves of panzers, this crippled their anti-aircraft defences at a time when their own air force had been crushed. The Germans then proceeded to annihilate the Red Army's anti-aircraft forces and air force as well, leaving the Soviets without any air defences and completely vulnerable to Stuka attacks. Some have claimed that the Soviet Union was going to attack Germany in the July of 1941, which is why the Germans had to invade in the June of 1941. Given the state of Soviet forces on the eve of the war, we can confidently conclude that this wasn't the case. They were outnumbered, didn't have anywhere near enough equipment, had massive logistical and supply issues, didn't have enough trucks, their tanks were out of date, their air force was basically useless, and they were forced to use their anti-aircraft guns as anti-tank guns and thus had no air defence. To attack would have been suicidal. In fact, to defend was suicidal, and it's no wonder that many chose to surrender. And this is why, when people claim that the Red Army soldier was cowardly or inferior to the amazing German Aryan, they've missed the other side of the equation. If you're getting attacked by tanks, artillery, infantry, dive bombers, and so on, and all you have is you and some outnumbered friends, a couple of rifles and an anti-tank gun, total defeat is your only option. If you had the equipment, and weren't overwhelmed by sheer weight of numbers, yeah, you'd fight back. And this is the point to take away. Looking at the total number of artillery guns alone does not tell the full story. There was a massive shortage of weapons and ammunition for the Soviets, but even with the weapons they did have, because of the lack of trucks and tractors, the Soviets deployed their forces in penny packets. So, if you imagine 100 Germans going up against 500 Soviets, yeah, they're outnumbered but not if the Soviets send in 50 men at a time. Obviously, this is an extreme example, but you get the point. The same applies with the Soviet artillery and tanks. They're actually outnumbered at the tactical level. And even if those scenarios were the not, they're missing the other arms, which means, as I've said before, they're playing rock, paper, scissors, but only allowed to pick rock. I will come back to look at the evolution of Soviet artillery over the course of the war, but I wanted to set the scene today. Many people still think that the Soviets were gearing up for war. Even when I show that not to be the case in my Keitel and Viktor Savorov video, many still claim to this day that just exposing how Viktor Savorov was willing to manipulate the evidence to support his conclusions didn't make his views invalid. Well, this video has shown that the Soviets weren't in a position to defend, let alone attack. If you're of the opinion that the Soviets were planning to attack the Germans and that the Germans had to do something about it, well, you might be interested in my Savora video. Thank you to my patrons for your continuing support. You make these videos possible because you're awesome. And to everyone, thanks for watching. Bye for now.